So welcome back to this afternoon's sessions on this compassion retreat. We're in session three now. Uh, we're looking at the actual compassion practice in this session. So the basis of this retreat, this compassion retreat are these four practices called the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. In this session, we're looking at the actual compassion practice. The next session we'll be looking at in conjunction with this practice, how to deal with anger. That's one of the obstacles for this practice. And then tomorrow morning, we'll look at the last two of the four immeasurables, empathetic joy, equanimity. And then also we'll move on to this exchanging self with others practice, which is building on the foundation of the four immeasurables. Included there is this technique of Tong Len, uh, giving and taking. And the last session then how to integrate these various practices into daily life. So let's have a look at what we'll be covering in this session. As per normal, we'll begin with a meditation and we'll continue uh, a meditation uh, relating to the topic in the last session, dealing with attachment. In this meditation, we'll simply look at the disadvantages of attachment in terms of, the remember, the first step in being able to deal with attachment is to clearly understand what it is and how it leads to suffering. So to develop the aspiration to be free of it, because if we don't understand it, uh, we'll probably think it's something useful and we'll continue to in, indulge in attachment because it, it seems like it's giving us happiness. So by reflecting on what really coming to see what is attachment and how it leads to suffering, i.e. the disadvantages of having attachment, we'll develop the aspiration to get rid of it, to deal with it, to eliminate it. So that's the meditation we're going to do shortly. Following that, we'll begin with a short review of some of the earlier points from the last two sessions. Then we'll look at compassion, what it is and how to cultivate it. The actual practice that we're going to do of compassion, the meditation on compassion. Um, following that, some tips for the practice as we did with loving kindness. And then talk a little bit about what's norm often referred to as compassion burnout to to understand what we mean by that a little bit better, because I think there's a, a little bit of confusion regarding this and we'll try and clarify that. And then finishing as per normal with some question answer. So let's begin with the meditation, uh, reflecting on the disadvantages of attachment, just to have a better understanding of attachment so we can really develop the aspiration to, uh, be, to eliminate it, to be free of it. So as always, we begin by preparing the body, setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. And using the out breath to relax and release any tightness or tension in any part of the body. Softening and relaxing all the muscles in the face. Mouth and jaw soft and relaxed. And all the muscles around the eyes soft and relaxed. In this way, allowing the entire body to become completely relaxed, completely at ease. Allowing the breathing to settle into its natural rhythm, 
allowing the breath to flow naturally and effortlessly. And with each out breath, letting go of any thoughts that may have arisen, happily releasing them. And allowing the mind to come to rest in the present moment. Not doing anything at all, simply being present. Knowing that you're aware. Resting in that stillness of the present moment. The first step in being able to effectively deal with attachment is to have a clear understanding of attachment, to know what it is and how it leads to suffering. And thereby we can cultivate the aspiration to be free of it. So, aspiration, uh, so attachment is defined as a mental factor that sees its object as attractive. It exaggerates the object's attractiveness and thus wishes to possess and hold the object. Why? Because it believes that object is the source of our happiness. So let's examine what effect attachment has in our life based on our own experiences. So first begin by checking what things you're attached to. For example, possessions, people, places or things. Now, it might be a little bit difficult to recognize what you're attached to. So think of things that you hold on to very dearly and don't want to be separated from. People are things that seem to be crucial or necessary for your happiness. <laughs> 
Now select one of the things that you have attachment for and ask yourself, how does that person or thing appear to me? Does my object of attachment really have all the good qualities that I'm attributing to it? Or is there some sort of in exaggeration involved? And then think of an occasion when that person or thing was not making you happy. At that time, did that person or thing still seem to have all those very same qualities? And because of perceiving all these good qualities in your object of attachment, do you develop any unrealistic expectations of that person or thing? expecting that that person or thing will always be there and will continue to make you happy. And does this ever lead to any worry or anxiety about being potentially separated from your object of attachment? And then imagine being totally separated from that person or thing. It's no longer there. How does your attachment make you feel? And then check, how does your attachment make you act? For example, do you sometimes disregard your ethical standards to get what you're attached to? And do you ever become manipulative or even maybe aggressive in order to get what you want? <laughs> 
So in conclusion, see attachment not as your friend bringing happiness, but as a thief destroying your peace of mind. And we can bring the meditation to a close. Let's begin with a short review. So again, the foundation for this compassion wing of practice are these four immeasurables, these four qualities we're cultivating towards all living beings. And here, particularly in Tibetan Buddhism, when we are cultivating these four qualities, we often find them coming in the form of a four line verse that we uh, recite and reflect on. Loving kindness, may all living beings have happiness in its causes. Immeasurable compassion, may they be free of suffering in its causes. Empathetic joy, may they never be separated from the happiness that is free from suffering. And equanimity, may they abide in equanimity, free of attachment and aversion to those near and far. And we saw there that loving kindness is a translation of the Sanskrit term Maitri, the Pali term Metta. Again, it's a wish or aspiration for ourselves and others to have happiness in its causes. And here, when we talk about happiness, we can talk about those two types of happiness, the temporal happiness, in other words, our pleasurable experiences, and genuine happiness or state of inner well-being. So when we are cultivating loving kindness, then we can cultivate that wish or aspiration for not only temporal happiness, but for particularly for genuine happiness, inner well-being. That is really the, the main focus of our loving kindness aspiration. And then we saw there that in terms of what are the causes of genuine happiness, that there are three main areas of practice. If we want to find that genuine happiness, that inner well being, then the foundation is ethics, avoiding harmful behavior. On that basis, we engage in the concentration practice to develop single point of concentration. And on that basis, we engage in the wisdom practice or Vipassana practice to gain a direct insight into the nature of reality. And by gaining a direct insight into nature of reality, we can overcome our distorted view of reality, which is uh, the underlying cause of our mental afflictions and suffering. So this insight into reality can help us to overcome all mental afflictions and suffering and thereby achieve this genuine happiness and inner well-being. So if we know what happiness is, the causes of happiness and how to cultivate those causes, then we can really cultivate this loving kindness for ourselves and others. And it's recommended to do that in stages, uh, first starting with ourself, then expanding out to friends, then to strangers, to difficult people, and eventually to all living beings. And then we saw that attachment is a mental affliction, something that agitates and disturbs our mind. And it's often what's called the near enemy of loving kindness in that it seems to be, particularly in terms of relationship now, it seems like attachment could be confused with loving kindness, but actually it's polluting and corrupting loving kindness. And so therefore it's important in relationships particularly to distinguish these two dynamics, um, the healthy dynamic of loving kindness, which is simply the wish for them to be happy. And then the unhealthy dynamic, which is attachment, which is all about me, that I want them to make me happy. So we saw there that attachment is a mental affliction. It's a mental factor that sees its object as attractive, it exaggerates the object's attractiveness, then wishes to possess and hold the object. Where does this attachment come from? What's the underlying uh, reason that attachment arises? It's our distorted view of reality. 
particularly at the deepest level, this grasping onto independent me, independent objective world. Because with this sort of distorted view, then when we have a pleasurable experience, when we see a person or thing, then it naturally seems like the attractiveness, the beauty is there in the object and that that object or person is actually the cause of my happiness. And so therefore attachment wants that person or thing because it seems to be the source of my happiness because the attractiveness seems to be objectively there in that object or person. And so that's something we'll be looking at in more detail again in the Vipassana retreats coming up, particularly the second one on emptiness. And then in terms of dealing with attachment, we saw there that the first step is to have a clear understanding of attachment, what it is and how it leads to suffering. Because if we don't understand this, then we'll think attachment actually is something pretty useful and that actually it's maybe our best friend bringing us happiness. And so we'll continually engage in craving attachment and create a lot of suffering, at least mental and probably physical suffering for ourselves and those around us. And then in addition to that, the next step is to cultivate the view of genuine happiness, to really see and understand that the source of happiness is not out there anywhere in the world. It lies within our own mind. Because as long as we see the source of happiness is out there, then naturally we'll follow craving and attachment because we'll want more and more of that stuff that seems to be giving us happiness. And then in terms of dealing with attachment as when it's arising, the first step, is with mindfulness, using mindfulness to simply observe the attachment as it arises. If we can observe it and not get caught up in it, then we're free of it and it will simply dissipate. Uh, so we don't need to fight with attachment. Um, in fact, if we fight with attachment, that'll just make it worse. So either following or trying to suppress and fight are the extremes that we're trying to overcome all we need to do is step back and watch. And then attachment can't go anywhere. It has no power to harm us or take us away. We can, we're free of it. And in addition to that, we saw that we can also apply antidotes to attachment. The one that's often recommended in the text is impermanence. And that is that attachment will generally see something as quite stable, something that we can hold on to there. But actually, if we can experientially see that object or person as changing moment by moment, then there's nothing for attachment to grab hold of and attachment can dissipate. Or at a deeper level, we can apply the wisdom of emptiness in terms of coming to realize that beauty is in the eye of the beholder or coming to see there's no me, where is the me here that's having this attachment? And thereby we can release the gra false grasping and therefore there's no basis for attachment to arise. So these are a few things we can do in terms of dealing with attachment. So that brings us to the topic for this session that is compassion itself. Again, that quote from Shanti Deva, those desiring to escape from suffering hasten right toward their own misery. And with the very desire for happiness out of delusion, they destroy their own well-being as if it were the enemy. Compassion in Sanskrit and Pali is karuna. And as with loving kindness, compassion is not an emotion. It's an aspiration. It's a wish. It's the aspiration or wish for ourselves and others to be free of suffering and its causes. The emotion that comes along with compassion is empathy. In fact, empathy is the emotion that precedes compassion, because it's empathy where we can connect with others, connect with others' suffering, and on that basis, compassion can arise. Now, we generally have already a desire to be free of suffering, but as with loving kindness, that's often misdirected. So even though we have a desire to be free of suffering, because we don't really know what suffering is and the cause of suffering, then our attempts to overcome suffering are often misdirected. And as Shanti Deva says, those des desiring to escape from suffering hasten right toward their own misery. So therefore, if we want to cultivate compassion, then we need to know what is suffering, what are the causes of suffering, and how do we eliminate those causes? Um, if we don't know those three things, then like loving kindness, compassion is simply words with no meaning. 
and also desiring to escape from suffering, we will hasten right toward our own misery. Uh, as Shanti Deva was uh, saying in his, his uh, quote there. So what is suffering? Normally when we hear the word suffering, we tend to uh, equate that with unpleasant, painful, physical and mental experiences. Here, the original term in Sanskrit is dukkha, in Pali, very similar, slightly different spelling uh, of dukkha. Now, this word dukkha is very difficult to translate. Um, the etymologies, uh, we can etymologize this word, the D-U-H prefix means bad, and ka can mean space or whole. So the etymology of dukkha can mean that you know, we're in a sort of a bad, something's not quite, bad space in terms of something's not quite right. The other, uh, um, in terms of whole, bad whole, um, sometimes in the old text, we, we see the analogy of a wooden cart with a wheel where the hole in the wheel is not very, uh, the axle doesn't fit the hole. So the bad hole, meaning the wheel's not turning freely. So something, it's not going very well. It's a bit of a bumpy ride because of that. So here, dukkha um, has a much broader meaning than simply the word suffering as we understand it. So to understand uh, what we mean by suffering or dukkha here, we can talk about three types of dukkha. The first is called the dukkha of suffering. And that's re re uh, with respect to, that is talking about now our unpleasant experiences. So that's how we would normally understand the word suffering. So that is something most obvious. And of course, we would like to be free of that. That's very obvious. To be free of pleasant, uh, unpleasant, painful experiences. But we can also talk about the dukkha of change, which is talking about our pleasant experiences. So this is not so obvious. And as we saw earlier, normally we identify this as happiness and therefore we end up with craving and attachment to our pleasant experiences. And that just brings a whole lot of um, suffering. So at a more subtle level, then we would also like to be free of that craving and attachment to our pleasant experiences because that just leads to suffering. But at the deepest level, we can talk about all pervasive dukkha. And that is the potential for suffering to arise. And that's something much less obvious. So the Buddhist assertion is that our human condition is such that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, there's always a potential for suffering to arise in our life. That conditions can come together and in the next moment we have that suffering to arise. And so therefore, in terms of compassion, we also want to be free of that. We want to be free of this unsatisfactory state that we find ourselves in, in terms of there's always a potential for suffering to arise. But to be free of that or to understand that, we have to really understand why is that potential there? And it's there because of the underlying causes of suffering. It's because of the mental afflictions in our mind, that there's always a potential for suffering to rise. So as long as we have craving, attachment, jealousy, anger, fear, anxiety in our mind, there's always a potential for suffering to arise in our life. And so these mental afflictions we saw, um, we can condense down to the three main mental afflictions called the three poisons, ignorance, attachment, and aversion. Ignorance is at here in these three poisons. Ignorance in general is just a deluded state of mind that's confused about its object. But here we're talking about a specific ignorance. We're talking about an ignorance that is confused about the nature of reality. In fact, it's a distorted view of reality. And we saw there in the earlier session that we distort reality in a number of different ways. One is we tend to see things which are changing as unchanging. We, we tend to see pleasure as happiness. We tend to, we grasp on where there's no self, an autonomous self. And then we see things which are dependent as independent. And so therefore, um, as long as we have this distorted view of reality, 
that will lead to attachment to pleasant things, aversion to unpleasant things, all the other mental afflictions will come out of that. That is driving our behavior and that's resulting in the situation we find ourselves in. And so these four distorted views, we're going to look at uh, what they are and how to overcome them in the two Vipassana retreats that are upcoming. So how do we, um, so how is it that ignorance, this distorted view of reality is the root cause of our suffering? And so here we have very well-known verse from Nagarjuna. He's a great second century uh, Indian Buddhist master um, who had a classic text on this emptiness practice that we'll be looking at in the second Vipassana retreat. And he says, by extinguishing actions and mental afflictions, there is liberation. Actions and mental afflictions arise from misconceptions and misconceptions arise from elaborations. Elaborations will cease through cultivating emptiness. Here, this word elaboration is another word for ignorance, is grasping onto independent existence, grasping onto independent me, independent objective world. So very briefly, and we'll look at this in more detail again in the Vipassana retreat, how is our distorted view of reality, how is grasping onto independent me, independent objective world, how is that the root cause of our suffering? So with that grasping to independent me, independent world, as we see in the, in the um, verse here, then uh, that leads to misconceptions. Here, the misconception is that uh, if we see something pleasant, we believe we see it as inherently pleasant, that the beauty is in the object. So that is attractive from the, its own side, objectively attractive. Or if we have an unpleasant experience, it's objectively unattractive. So that's the misconception, either seeing things as inherently attractive or unattractive based on our experience. That will lead to mental afflictions in terms of having craving and attachment for those pleasant things that seem to be there, aversion to the unpleasant things. And those, that will lead to the other mental afflictions. And those mental afflictions are driving our behavior, our actions, and those actions result in our current situation of suffering or dukkha. So that's very briefly the process of how mental afflictions, particularly our distorted view of reality, leads to suffering. And again, we'll look at that process in much more detail in the Vipassana retreat later. So how do we eliminate the causes of suffering then? And we see here in this verse, the last line, elaborations will cease through cultivating emptiness. So we can eliminate this distorted view of reality, this ignorance through cultivating emptiness, the wisdom realizing there is no independent me, no independent objective world. That's the wisdom of emptiness. And there's another verse we saw in the Shamatha uh, retreat when we looked at the Shamatha chart, which said the root of samsara is cut through the union of shamatha and vipassana observing emptiness. So on the basis of a calm, clear, focused mind of shamatha, we investigate nature of reality, we come to realize emptiness, and thereby we can cut the root of samsara. That is, of course, ignorance, thereby cut mental afflictions and therefore cut the suffering they produce. So this is suffering, its causes, and how to eliminate those causes. So therefore, if we know those three things, then we can really start to cultivate compassion for ourselves. And therefore, by cultivating compassion for ourselves, that would inspire us to actually eliminate the causes of suffering and to cultivate compassion for others to help others to do likewise. So in terms of cultivating compassion, like loving kindness, very much recommended that we uh, do that in stages. So the classic uh, stages, the four stages in the text, as with loving kindness, first cultivate it to friends, then strangers, then enemies, the difficult people, and then towards all living beings, which is immeasurable compassion. But as before, I think in our modern society, we need to first cultivate compassion for ourselves. Again, in the modern world, we tend to not be feeling so good about ourselves and often have low self-esteem, even self-hatred. So we, that's where we need to begin. Cultivate compassion for ourselves first, and then we can expand that out to others. And so that's what we're going to do in the meditation. And we'll follow a similar 
process with the loving kindness in terms of using that visualization with the inner purity of our mind and with the um, aspirations with the um, may you be free of suffering and its causes may you be free of all mental afflictions and then the rest of the visualization uh, we won't go through here i'll just go through it in the practice it's fairly self-explanatory so this slide again here is for your own benefit for later to understand the stages of this meditation practice so let's go straight to the meditation so let's begin so finding a nice comfortable posture Setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. and relaxing more deeply with each out-breath. and setting the mind in a state of ease and relaxation. Simply allowing it to come to rest in the stillness of the present moment. So let's now bring the uh, begin the actual compassion practice. So remember, compassion is the wish or aspiration for ourselves and others to be free of suffering and its causes. And we can begin by cultivating compassion for ourselves and then expanding out to others. And again, no matter how much mental afflictions in our in our mind so no matter how much uh, craving and attachment anger and jealousy fear and anxiety and so forth are in our mind these mental afflictions are not part of the nature of our mind they're merely like dirt covering the surface of our mind and beneath these mental afflictions is the natural purity of our mind so imagine this inner purity of your mind in the form of a small white radiant sphere of light in the center of your chest at the level of your heart. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if I were free of suffering and its causes. May I be free of all suffering and its causes. <laughs> 
May I be free of all mental afflictions. And then imagine your mental afflictions and suffering in the form of black smoke filling your body. And then with each in-breath, imagine drawing that black smoke into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. So with each in-breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing your mental afflictions and suffering at your heart, dissolving it into the inner purity of your mind. And then imagine you're now completely free of all mental afflictions and suffering. And simply rest in that freedom, rest in that inner purity of mind. And just as you wish to be free of suffering, so does everyone else. So next bring to mind someone close to you, a loved one, who's experience, currently experiencing some sort of physical or mental problem or suffering. And picture them very clearly in front of you. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they were free of that problem, free of that suffering. May you be free of all suffering and its causes. And then imagine their problem or suffering in the form of black smoke filling their body. And then with each in-breath, imagine drawing that black smoke out of their body and bringing it into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. So with each in-breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing their suffering at your heart. And then imagine they're now completely free of that problem, free of that suffering. 
and take joy in this. And then next bring to mind someone who you know well, who's neither a friend nor someone who you dislike and is currently experiencing some sort of uh, physical or mental problem or suffering. And again, picture them very clearly in front of you. And arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they are free of that problem, free of that suffering. May you be free of all suffering in its causes. Imagining their problem or suffering in the form of black smoke filling their body. And with each in-breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing their suffering at your heart. And then imagine they're now completely free of that problem or suffering and take delight in this. And then next bring to mind a difficult person, someone who you dislike. And imagine them very clearly in front of you. They are just like yourself in wanting to be free of suffering. So arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they are free of suffering and its causes. May you be free of all mental afflictions and suffering. Imagining their mental afflictions and suffering in the form of black smoke filling their body. And with each in breath, imagine drawing their mental afflictions and suffering out of their body and bringing it into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. So with each in breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing their mental afflictions and suffering at your heart. And then imagine they're now completely free of all mental afflictions and suffering. And take joy in this. <laughs> 
and then release all appearances and allow the mind to come to rest. To rest in that inner purity of mind, which is in the nature of compassion. And so we can bring the meditation to a close. So as with loving kindness, a few tips for the practice here. Similarly, as loving kindness, uh, it's helpful for the compassion practice to start with ourself, particularly if we're suffering from any low self-esteem to really cultivate that compassion for ourselves first as a basis for others. And again, with compassion, as with loving kindness, we can focus on individuals. Um, and when we, once we get familiar with the practice more, we can expand out and focus on groups as a whole as well. And then how do we cultivate for the difficult people? Because again, it often seems like they don't deserve our compassion because they're just a, such a bad person. And so the answer comes in the next session when we looked at uh, this idea of cognitive fusion. And once again, if we find the visualization difficult with this, um, we, or we don't like to do visualization, then that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that aspiration, the wishing them to be free of suffering, wishing them to be free of mental afflictions, that to cultivate that, that wish. And then some obstacles for compassion. So again, we can talk about the, what's called the near enemy and the far enemy. Near enemy is something that seems like compassion, but it's actually not compassion. So one common thing here is this sense of despair. Um, when we, we try and when we see others suffering, so we tend to get overwhelmed for that. Um, and one way to overcome that we'll look at tomorrow morning first session in terms of the empathetic joy practice because here with that despair, we tend to have this obsessive focus on the negative. Another near enemy to compassion is, can be, is pity, um, where in pity, we sort of tend to put ourselves above others a little bit in terms of poor you, you're suffering, but I'm sort of okay. And we sort of pity them. We're not sort of connecting with them. So um, one way to overcome that is to, because that pity often comes because we're very quite self-centered. And so a, a way to help overcome that is through the exchanging self with others. And we'll look at that in the uh, second session tomorrow. And then the far enemy, what is diametrically opposite to compassion, the wish them to be free of suffering is cruelty, wishing them to uh, have a lot of suffering. And so uh, we'll be looking a little bit related to that in the next session. Uh, dealing with anger, because anger here is the intent to harm, the wish to harm. And then one last topic before we go to question and answer, and that is something very relevant for us in the modern world, this idea of compassion burnout. Um, and what we can understand, what we're going to understand here is it's it's not really compassion burnout, in, in certainly in the sense of um, how we've defined compassion here. Compassion is this wish or aspiration for ourselves and others to be free of suffering and its causes. So, I mean, we can't be burnt out by cultivating that wish or aspiration. So what we normally hear as compassion burnout is actually uh, empathy burnout. And so let's have a look at why that's the case. And to look at that, I want to look at an article uh, titled From Empathy to Compassion in a Neuroscience Laboratory. And this, you've got, you 
you can find it on the internet there. I've got the um, internet address there, the URL for you. But actually that um, article is an excerpt from a book called Altruism, the Power of Compassion to Change Yourself and the World by Mathieu Ricard, a very well-known uh, French uh, monk in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And so he's, I've taken a few things from the uh, article here. And he says, in 2007, along with Tanya Singer, I was in Rainer Goebbels Neuroscience Laboratory in Maastricht as a collaborator and guinea pig in a research program on empathy. Tanya would ask me, Tanya's the research scientist, um, Tanya would ask me to give rise to a powerful feeling of empathy by imagining people affected by great suffering. During a pause after a first series of periods of meditation, Tanya asked me, what are you doing? It doesn't look at all like what we usually observe when people feel empathy for someone else's suffering. And so then he said, I explained that I had meditated on unconditional compassion, trying to feel a powerful feeling of love and kindness for people who were suffering, but also for all sentient beings. When I engaged in meditation on altruistic love and compassion, Tanya noted the cerebral networks activated were very different. In particular, the network linked to negative emotions and distress was not activated during meditation on compassion, while certain cerebral areas traditionally associated with positive emotions with the feeling of affiliation and maternal love, for instance, were, they were activated. So we arrived at the idea that burnout was in fact a kind of empathy fatigue and not compassion fatigue. And going on, he says, these three dimensions, love of the other, empathy, which is resonance with others suffering and compassion are naturally linked. When altruistic love encounters suffering, it manifests as compassion. This transformation is triggered by empathy, which alerts us to the fact that the other is suffering. One may say that when altruistic love passes through the prism of empathy, it becomes compassion. So empathy is what precedes compassion. And then he says, the person who feels compassion and kindness can develop the strength of mind and desire to come to the aid of the other. Compassion and altruistic love have a warm, loving and positive aspect that stand alone empathy for the suffering of other uh, the suffering of the other does not have. And so he says in, in summarizing, he says, so it was clear from my perspective that if there was an empathy fatigue leading to the syndrome of emotional exhaustion, there was no fatigue of love and compassion. Without the support of love and compassion, empathy left to itself is like an electric pump through which no water circulates it will quickly overheat and burn. So empathy should take place within a much vaster space of altruistic love. And so we saw that in terms of both love and compassion, we have to have that wisdom to understand what is happiness, what is suffering, what are the cause of suffering, what is the cause of happiness. And so he comments here, he says, it is also important to consider the cognitive aspect of compassion. In other words, understanding the different levels of suffering and its manifest and latent causes. We will we'll be able to thus place ourselves in the service of others by helping them effectively while still preserving our inner strength, our kindness and our inner peace. So in summarizing all of that, um, empathy is, is a connecting with others suffering, but if that comes together with a lack of wisdom then that will simply lead to empathic distress or burnout, what is commonly called compassion burnout. Whereas empathy plus wisdom, wisdom uh, here we looked at in terms of compassion and loving kindness, that will lead to compassion and no burnout. We can't burn out from the wish or aspiration for ourselves and others to be free of suffering and its causes. But if we don't have that wisdom, understanding what is suffering, what are the causes of suffering, how to overcome those causes, then we simply empathize with others suffering and it seems like it's hopeless. There's no hope 
and then we get overwhelmed by that and then we end up with empathic distress or what's commonly called compassion burnout but actually it's uh, empathy burnout so therefore again it's very important uh, in this context to again understand what is suffering what are the causes of suffering and how to eliminate those causes then the empathy can really um, manifest as compassion and and as uh, Matthew Ricard says here, then we can place ourselves in the service of others by helping them effectively while still preserving our inner strength, our kindness and our inner peace. Okay, so that's uh, all I wanted to cover in this session. So we've still got some time left for Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, then again, switch on webcam and mic and ask away. Hey, hi, Glenn. This is Atul. Hi, Atul. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. good. Thanks for the ses Thanks for the session. Sure. Um, so, so I had a question on um, mindfulness and compassion. Right. Uh, because in the practice of compassion, what tends to happen is I struggle with thinking of others, even if it's a friend or enemy or whatever it is. And there's a certain sense of uh, self-absorption. You know, you're just focusing on, on myself and my feelings and my thoughts and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So um, does one build a better, let's say, a practice of shamatha first, where you're not so, let's say, tormented by your own thoughts and then explore compassion? Uh, or can these two run in parallel? Uh, what's, what's the kind of uh, approach there? Yeah. Yeah, good question. As I, I think I briefly mentioned at the start uh, of today, um, these five retreats we're doing, uh, two shamatha, one compassion, two vipassana, are covering these three sort of core areas of practice in pretty well all Buddhist traditions. Um, and the foundation is shamatha. The foundation is to cultivate a calm, clear, focused mind. Because if we don't do that, then we, as you mentioned, we can put a lot of time and energy into not only compassion practice, but also Vipassana practice, but not really get anywhere because either we're distracted by things or we're sort of half asleep. We're not very focused on what we're doing. We can't, because both compassion, with both compassion and the wisdom practice, we are really transforming our mind. And that transformation uh, can only happen effectively if we have a very focused, clear mind. Otherwise, if it's not, it, it sort of becomes just a little bit of an intellectual um, and it doesn't really penetrate uh, and we're distracted. And so we can put a lot of time and energy into any of these sort of compassion or wisdom practices and not really get very far. Um, so therefore shamatha is really the basis of that does that mean though we first just do shamatha and we do compassion and wisdom later um no um because each one of these three areas of practice will support and enhance the other two so therefore if we don't do any wisdom or compassion practice and we say, well, okay, since shamatha is the basis of those two, I'm just going to do shamatha now for some weeks or months and I'll do that compassion and wisdom stuff later. Then I think you'll find that it's going to be extremely difficult to do the shamatha practice because our mental afflictions and our grasping and that will create obstacles to shamatha practice. Whereas if we introduce some compassion and wisdom practices as we're maybe emphasizing the shamatha practice, those two practices are going to help support and enhance the shamatha practice. So you'll find that um, they help and support each other. So therefore it would be helpful to do a sort of a, a holistic approach covering all three areas of practice. Now, we can, and we probably should, uh, emphasize 
those three elements differently at different times, depending on where we're at and what we need to emphasize. So the balance, I mean, we need to cover all three, but how we balance will be a little bit dynamic in terms of where we're at and what we need to attend to. But certainly uh, at the ground level, we need to cover all three bases because if we don't, if we only do one of those three practices, then you'll find that it's going to be difficult to make significant progress in that element. Whereas if we cover all three bases, then that's going to maximize our effectiveness in all each one of those three, because the other two will enhance and support that one. So that's basically um, the short answer. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, helpful. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Atul. Thank you. We've still got time for one or two more questions before we take a break. If anyone has a question. Glenn, I, uh, I have one question uh, regarding sure. the practice that you introduced last time. I don't know if this is, uh, if this is okay in this retreat to ask uh, questions. Uh, retrospectively <laughs> sure 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 uh, it was about the the awareness of awareness practice and it's it's a very practical question it's just in, in between this uh, the last retreat and this retreat i've been experimenting with that practice and what right. i find is that uh, uh, i i keep my eyes open and there is a tendency for the eyes to then kind of uh, focus out on on whatever is is in front of me which uh, <laughs> yep bring some some also some some tension in the face and I try to relax that and then there's tension again. So I, I've, I've heard others recommending like mindfuls or there are different ways of dealing with that. But what's your recommendations uh, for this? Uh... Yeah, may, maybe I think I mentioned something in the Shamatha retreat about that at some point. Um, again, for many of us and, and that particular practice um, has a specific recommendation to meditate with your eyes open. And we mentioned three or four reasons for that in terms of clarity and present moment and, and cutting down duality and transitioning to daily life. Um, but the reality is, I think for many of us, uh, our visual gaze dominates. And as you mentioned, if we try and meditate with eyes open, then our visual gaze tends to sort of roam around and look at all sorts of things. Um, so as a sort of temporary short-term strategy for that, we can do a number of things. One, as you mentioned, is we can use something that's called mindfold, but also it's just basically a, a 3D co a contoured sleeping mask that you put over your face that allows your eyes to be open and not pressing against the eyes. Um, and that, with that, that, there's nothing to see. It's completely dark. So that can be very helpful um, to get in the habit of meditating with eyes open uh, and there's nothing to track the gaze. Or alternatively, if you can manage uh, to make your room completely dark. I mean, if you can make it completely dark, and then basically also just have like a blank wall in front of you. So there's, there's nothing to attract the attention. So even if you can't make it completely dark, but you just have like a blank wall in front of you, then there's nothing for the visual gaze to lock onto. Um, so that, that can be helpful. And if that's not possible and there is the move, eyes are moving around everywhere because there's a lot of things to, to lock onto even as a sort of a shorter term temporary strategy is to pick a spot and just have that as your sort of anchor point. So it's better to be sort of anchoring on one spot than the eyes moving around everywhere. Um, of course, that's not really part of the practice, but that's a short term uh, strategy. So personally, I prefer to uh, do a fairly dark room or if I'm in a place where that's not possible, I use a I use a, a, a sleeping mask, a, a contoured one where you can have your eyes open. I find them very helpful. Thank you very much. I will I'll sure. try to get one of those. Sure, sure. Good, good. I think we've got time for one more question, if anyone has, before we take a, another short break. Hi, Glenn. Hi. Mikkel. Mikkel number two. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for wonderful sessions. 
Sure. Uh, I just had a thought I would like to comment on, which is that it sure. seems that when we talk about um, attachment and this practice of, you know, releasing animosity towards others, there seems to be like part of codependency seems to be to be preoccupied with other people's problems. And so the attachment in a way also is, is an attachment to the problem itself. Like mm -hmm. uh, you can be attached to drama or excitement or, you know, the, sure. the excitement of the drama in itself. Is that in line with Buddhist thinking as well? Is what in line? That notion of that part of the attachment itself can be the attachment to the actual drama with the person. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, yeah, I, I mean, we can be attached to anything and the thing is that where we are with, with attachment, basically the underlying mechanism is that happiness is out there. That's what's driving the attachment. And so therefore, if there's nothing out there, then we want something out there that we can focus on, <laughs> you know? So we can be attached to anything out there uh, because we want stimulus, because attachment wants stimulus. So any sort of stimulus is better than no stimulus. Um, because it seems like, um, you know, we, 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 it seems like that, that stimulus is, is really going to make us happy, happy, even if it's negative stimulus. So often negative stimulus is better than no stimulus. <laughs> and so because that's why, because we're caught up in that whole thing. So yeah, that's, we can be attached to anything. We can be attached to suffering. <laughs> so, yeah, and I, um, well, you know, the notion of being attached to the, like I find that one of the reasons why I sometimes uh, find it hard to have compassion with people is that I find out that there's actually secondary gains on my part for keeping a picture of them as a bad person. <laughs> you know, it, it kind of, it takes me off the hook. Whereas if I, if I, if I really see them for who they are, I know that they can be very different than the way they might have acted towards me or how I related to them. Yeah. Um, True. Yeah. Yeah. And again, often, often, you know, if we can see them as a bad person, then it makes us feel better, you know, or, or at least I'm not that bad, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, um, but again, it's all, it's all, that's all to do with, this sort of obsessive self-focus and that's something we'll be looking at in terms of this exchanging self with others so we'll cover that in the second session tomorrow a little bit more a bit more detail on that tomorrow and a little bit more on related to what you talked about in the next session in terms of this cognitive fusion so you might find that interesting as well and we'll look at that in the next session after the meditation Okay, um, it's time for another break now. So let's let's take a break and come back in 30 minutes. And in the last session, we'll be looking at how to deal with anger. So that's the topic for the last session. So let's take a break and I'll see you back in 30 minutes.